This is lesson number three in our uh, Forbidden Topics uh, series. Lesson number three entitled, The Four Phases of Addiction. Four Phases of Addiction. And it's the first part of uh, kind of a sub-series that's within uh, this larger series here. So in the next three sessions, as the title suggests, we're going to be talking about addictions in general. And in the first three, uh, first of these rather, I, I want to examine addictions from a physical and a psychological uh, perspective. I'm neither a doctor or a psychologist, but in order to understand addictions, uh, you have to uh, take a look at it from a medical and from a psychological perspective. We certainly will enter uh, into a discussion about uh, what the Bible says about this and so on and so forth. But for tonight, we're going to look at what addictions are, how we become addicted, and the effects of addiction once they take hold. And then of course, as I mentioned in subsequent lessons, we're going to see what the Bible says about addictions their consequences and how God helps us avoid them or helps us deal with them if they have a hold on us. Hopefully uh, these lessons will give us both insight and warning about the power that various substances have to control and destroy our lives. And even if we ourselves, you know, I'd say I talk to the people here in the, in the auditorium and of course the folks who are watching online, uh, we may not be dealing with addiction ourselves, but I find it you know, a pretty common thing that if I talk to anybody here, they'll say, well, myself, no, but my brother or my dad was an alcoholic or my, you know. So I think it touches all of us one way or another, either directly we've had to struggle with addictions or we've had to help others in our family or among our friends or coworkers deal uh, with uh, this. So I think and hope that the material that we'll be looking at will be useful uh, from all of these perspectives. In the last several years, there has been a lot of research done on the causes and the effects of various addictions on human beings. Using a modern MRI technology, scientists are able to see the actual reaction that the brain has when it is stimulated by various effects. Not just drugs, various effects like music. I remember reading a book entitled, This Is Your Brain on Music. Fascinating, fascinating book on how music affects the brain or visual uh, images, as well as chemicals. And of course, we're talking about perhaps illegal chemicals, illegal uh, drugs, how they affect the brain. In this type of research, scientists have identified neural circuits that are involved in the actions of every known drug of abuse and have specified common pathways that are affected by almost all substances. In other words, they affect the brain in exactly the same way. They may be different types of substances, but they have the same effect uh, on the brain. This means that all illegal drugs have a similar effect on the brain that can actually be seen in an X-ray. Okay. So, uh, you can put up to view the MRI or the X-ray of a non-drug user's brain next to that of an addict, and you can easily tell the difference. And here in this, it's actually a photograph in this slide, the brain of a non-addict and then the brain of a drug addict, and you see or you are able to see with the, you know, the naked eye, the difference. Of course, you need a, a medical uh, expert to be able to you know, explain what's going on here. But just, you know, uh, just a simple look uh, tells you uh, that drugs or illegal substances have a very specific 
effect on the brain. Researchers are now able to indicate elements that are common to all addictions, regardless of the substances that are used. And so this has led many researchers, including Dr. Alan Leshner, who's the former director of the National Drug Institute here in the United States, uh, to declare that addiction is a brain disease. And I'm, I'll unpack that idea. I know that some of you right, out, right, out, uh, right off the bat are saying, wait a minute, you know, you know, we don't believe that you know, sin is a disease. Well, no, I don't believe that either, but just give me a moment to kind of show you the connection, all right? From a biblical uh, perspective, we can accept that many things that are considered as sins immoral sexual activity or drunkenness or pride or gluttony can easily evolve to a point where they incapacitate the body as an illness. In other words, it starts as a sin, it eventually becomes an illness. Now the fact that it eventually becomes an illness doesn't excuse the individual from the sin part. But if you understand that it's an illness, then you can treat both the uh, physical side of the problem as well as the spiritual side of the problem. Uh, the idea uh, that you say to someone who has a serious addiction of some kind, you know, look, just pick yourself up by your bootstraps you know, and uh, snap out of it. You know. I I'm going to slap that, that addiction out of you. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that won't work, okay? For example, the disease, the disease of AIDS. The disease of AIDS all by itself is not not a sin. But the leading method of transmitting AIDS, sex between two men, that is a sin. Romans 1 verse 27. The disease of addiction is not a sin in itself, but the abuse of alcohol or certain drugs leading to addiction, yeah, that is a sin. Uh, being delusional or depressed, that's not a sin, but an unrestrained pride and uh, overestimation of our self-worth that often causes these emotional problems yeah, that's a sin. See what I'm saying? Some things are sin at the beginning, but eventually they evolve into diseases. I say this because many Christians don't make a distinction between the cause, many times, but not always, sin, and the ultimate effect, many times, but not always, disease. So if someone you know, uh, goes to the minister and says, and, and, and talks to him and says, you know what, uh, I'm a drug addict. You know, here's my MRI to prove it. Here's, look at my brain, you know, I'm, I'm addicted. And I'll, we'll talk about what real addiction is. And he confesses that to his minister and, and he says, pray for me, please. And I'm sorry that I'm, I'm addicted and all the things that I've done you know, because of my addiction and have been terrible and so on and so forth. And the minister, you know, they, they, they you know, clasp hands and, and the minister prays for him and, and calls out to God and asks God, please, this son of yours who is ill and sick and diseased and so on, you know, please forgive him for his sin. You know, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 to 9, right? We are confident that if we confess our sins, God will forgive us our sins. However, that same individual in the minister's office will not be cured of his disease, even if he's been forgiven of his sin. Well, we have to realize that. It's not always easy to help people that are afflicted 
with disease. Yes, they brought it on themselves. Yes, you know, nobody put a gun to their head you know, to, to take that first hit of crack or whatever. Yes, yes, yes. They're responsible. It's their fault. They shouldn't have done it. Their parents told them not to do it. Their friends told them not to do it. Even the minister who is now praying for them told them, don't do it. <laughs> they went ahead and did it anyways. That's all true. That's all forgivable. But the cold hard fact is now where we're at is we have an individual who, as the doctor says, has a brain disease and needs to be treated both spiritually and physically for his disease. So we have to be very careful when we label something as sinful. In this first session, therefore, we're going to deal with addictions from a disease point of view. And then next week, we'll look at the things that lead to many of these addictions and what the Bible says about them. All right, there's just too much stuff to put in one lesson, 30 minutes, can't do it. So how we become addicted. Part of the research on addiction is charting the common elements that lead to all addictions. Here are the four phases in the progression of addiction. Phase uh, number one. Phase number one is learning the mood swing. Learning the mood swing. When it comes to addiction, learning is accomplished experimentally and not intellectually. Right, we learn to memorize poetry, we learn that intellectually but we don't learn how to become addicted intellectually. Addiction is learned instinctively, intuitively, spontaneously, naturally. And so we become addicted to something using our instincts, our intuition, our natural feelings. And so the first phase in addiction is that we, we learn certain things. For example, we learn that certain chemicals produce euphoria. Euphoria is a feeling of some kind that changes our state of mind. It is always beyond natural feelings. That's why it's called a high. You're very, you're not just happy, you're very happy. You're very relaxed. You're very excited. You're very confident. One of the jokes uh, about uh, the use of marijuana, for example, is that the first time you take marijuana, uh, the one of the first times that you take marijuana is that everything is very funny. <laughs> I remember the first time that I took uh, pot, that I smoked pot with someone, ne never had done it before, and they said, and they said Try this, and, and I said, why not? Those are the worst two words in the English language, why not? If had somebody been there to smack me at the side of the head and show me why not. But all I remember from that first experience was laughing. Laughing so hard that my, my sides were aching. And there was nothing funny. I mean, the, it's not as if somebody told a joke, it just, Everything seemed so funny. That's why it's a high. Everything is heightened. Now the feeling is real. But the problem is that it's an exaggerated reality. This is where the MRIs come in. They can track which part of the brain is being affected by the substance that a person is taking and how the brain is reacting. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's an MRI showing uh, marijuana use. All of the, uh, you know, the spots and the dots there are uh, a picture of the THC chemical, which is the active ingredient in marijuana that gives the high, the euphoria. Uh, and it demonstrates how uh, the THC is spreading to different parts of the brain, affecting speech, sensory skills, 
motor skills, everything was funny. And I remember you know, doing more and more of it. Everything was, everything was funny and everything was like very perceptive. Oh, the blue is so blue. I never ever seen a blue that's that blue, you know, that type of thing, sensory. But I couldn't walk straight. <laughs> so a lot of things are heightened, but a lot of things also are you know, out of whack. So we learn that the degree of euphoria is determined by the quantity of chemical that we ingest. We learn this. And so if we take too much, we get what's called a bad high. We get sick. We become you know, psychotic, afraid, delusional. If we take too little, well, there's no high, there is no euphoria. And so we begin to learn just how much is required to get us to that place that gives us the, uh, the pleasant feeling, the high, if you wish. Now, a key lesson learned in phase one is we learn to trust chemicals and their effects because they work every time. Every time I smoke up, I get off. It happens every time. It's dependable. You think that, but it's the first thing you learn. It doesn't happen the very first time you do drugs of some kind. We try a substance, but with repeated use, we eventually learn, again, intuitively, naturally, this lesson. And so this is what phase one looks like on a chart. The X in the middle is normal, the normal state. On the left is pain, on the right is euphoria. Note that the addiction occurs when we go from normal to euphoria. Normal to euphoria, yeah, I'm on the chart here. Normal to euphoria and then slowly back to normal again. Now, the meds that you take when you have legitimate pain do not become addictive if you stop taking them when the pain stops. I don't know how many people I've met who, I don't want the pain medication. They, they have these things about pain medication. You know, they, 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 they mix pain medication with the illegal uh, drugs. And they said, I don't want to take any pain medication. I'm just going to gut it out. You know, I don't know, I've got a cracked vertebrae or I've got a, a swollen knee. You know, I, you know, the doctor has prescribed, take one of these every four hours you know, and uh, add some uh, heat or cold or whatever for your, for your injury. And uh, so-and-so, especially Christians, they're going to be heroes. Oh, so I'm not taking any of that stuff. I'm not taking any drugs at all. I'm just going to gut it out. You know? And then when they just can't take it anymore, you know, then, they'll, then they'll take the pain medicine. And it doesn't work very well for them. Why? Because for pain medicine to work properly, you've got to take it according to what the doctor has prescribed it in the way he's prescribed it. He said, she said, depends who your doctor is, you, know, you take one of these every six hours or whatever, every four hours. Not every 18 hours, <laughs> not every hour and a half. Yeah, every six hours, why? Because you, 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 you start taking the pain medication and the pain medication starts to work and it calms down that inflammation and, 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 and it you know, blocks the message to the brain that says, ouch, this hurts, you know? and you begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, the inflammation starts to go down and then the inflammation starts to go down, then the, the pain signals settle down. And you know, uh, that's why they give you more than just one pill. They give you so much for a week or a month or whatever it is. You know? And, and you get into the routine of taking those. And the goal is simply to manage your pain until something can be done, whether it's surgery or you know, whatever it is, okay? Now, some people, of course, abuse their pain medication. 
instead of taking one every four to six hours, wherever they take, you know, two or three at a time, then they begin crushing them up, you know, and taking three or four of them and crushing them up and taking them all at once. Why? Because they're no longer dealing with pain. Now what they're trying to do is what? They're trying to get the euphoria, that feeling. So people become addicted to painkillers because when they return to normal, uh, they use them to create euphoria instead of going you know, uh, from normal to pain back to normal. They want to use the, uh, the pain medication, which is legal. They want to use the pain medication to go beyond taking care of my pain to euphoria. I remember a pain uh, management doctor in California uh, telling me, uh, because I was concerned about this, uh, telling me, it was a woman, she said, she says, you won't be addicted uh, if you do two things. And I said, okay, what are that? So first of all, follow my prescription, do, you know, what I, do what I say, and only take them so long as you have pain. So long as you're taking them for pain, you won't get addicted. The minute you don't have any pain anymore and you continue taking the pain medication, you will become addicted because now you're taking them simply to find the euphoria, okay? So that's phase one. You learn the mood swing. You discover, oh, wait a minute, there's an altered reality in my mind that I can go to using chemicals that makes me feel good, better than I normally feel. Well, then you go to phase two. Phase two is seeking the mood swing. Once you've learned to trust chemicals, you move to the second phase of addiction where you are now actually seeking the mood swing. This phase has its own progress. First, you begin using chemicals at, an appro at appropriate times and places. In other words, you only use, you, know, you only smoke up, you only drop, a pill, you only take whatever, your, your, your pain meds, whatever, at parties or just to relax. Or, I'm going to relax, nobody's home, I got a movie happening, a little food, I'm going you know, to take a couple of these pills or I'm going to smoke a joint or two, whatever, whatever your drug is. And then the next stage is you learn to control the quantity and the outcome of chemical using experiences. In other words, you avoid overdosing and hangovers and you don't take so much that you get sick. You keep things under control. You remain what's called highly functional while using. I remember when I was using, and of course this was, you know, a long time ago, it was back in the 70s, but I still remember, uh, I would go to work, I was already stoned, and I would go to work, you know, fresh suit, white shirt and tie, you know, and it's not like I worked in, the, in, the, in, an, in an office all by myself where nobody knew anybody. I mean, I, was a, I managed a music store, five of them. We had, you know, 50 employees. <laughs> We had customers coming in and out, you know. But I was able to just, you know, just use enough to not be at the normal stage, but be at the high stage, but keep it all under control. Social users remain in this phase. And most people think, and here's the thing, most people think they can remain indefinitely in this phase. I remember thinking, man, is this ever great? <laughs> I mean, what, what a life. Uh, I'm making a lot of money. I get enough money to buy all the drugs that I want. I can take the drugs and so long as I'm, you know, I'm careful and you know, I'm just, I'm, I've got it under control. I've got the best of both worlds. So phase two on the chart still looks like this you're still seeking the mood swing. You go from normal to euphoria, back to normal. You know, you, you've got that little track going. 
Phase three is chemical dependence. There's no time frame between phase two and phase three. Events, our own character, the repetition of our consumption eventually leads to phase three. Now you know you're there because like phase one and two, phase three has its own markers, which include the following. A person experiences growing anticipation and preoccupation with his or her chemical use. In other words, you start spending more time thinking and worrying about not having access. Yeah, I got to go to work. I used to work from uh, two in the afternoon till 10 o'clock at night. And, and, and in the morning it was like, yeah, I got everything done. Oh, oh my, I've run out of drugs. I got to call my guy. I got to have, uh, I start work at two o'clock, you know. <laughs> Your lifestyle begins to change and it, be, it revolves around chemical use. You begin to lose control over times or amount of use. In other words, before, you know, just you know, smoke up, do something before to go to work, get a buzz on, uh, maybe uh, you know, during your lunch time or supper, go out for supper, do something different just to kind of smooth out the rest of the night. That, 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 that went on for a year or two, you know. But then uh, smoking up in the morning, in the afternoon, taking something else uh, later on in the afternoon, then at supper, something at night to uh, you know, go to sleep on pretty soon. And then the usage begins to promote behavior that violates your personal value system. People steal in order to use, or they're immoral while they're using. I don't want to begin listing the things that I did, but they were things that certainly I would never do. Uh, Sober-minded. Also, you adopt a user peer group that accepts this behavior. There were a couple of guys at my work who are also users, and so we were, you know, we hung out together. This kind of callous negative feeling about self begins to grow without being identified or addressed. In other words, you don't feel good about yourself, you don't like yourself, you know, but you, 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 you refuse to say, the reason I don't like myself, the reason that all of this is happening, the reason I look in the mirror and I'm not so you know, in love with the person that I used to see there is because I'm, I'm doing way too much drugs and it's affecting me. Uh, no, no, that can't, that can't be it. <laughs> Surely that can't be it. It's gotta be something else. And then no one in a user circle will challenge your bad behavior. You know, the guys I worked with, actually they worked for me. They were, hey, he's the boss. If he says, hey, let's shut the store down, let's go over here and you know, relax and smoke up and you know, as long as the owner wasn't around, they didn't say no. And then you learn to rationalize and suppress your feelings. You begin to be separate and alone. You start projecting self-hatred onto other people. You start having conflict with family. I remember my mother saying, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> I got so bad. At one point, I was at my mom's, and I mean, my mom, you know, she didn't, I mean, as a grown man, so she thought everything is fine. I was at my mom's and you know, I couldn't wait till she went to bed so I could use. <laughs> You're pretty bad when you get to that point. So tolerance of chemicals leads to more ingenious ways to get and to use chemicals. I had a network. I use myself as an example, but it's pretty common. 
And then there are the rituals of drug taking, experimentation with type and quantity. Uh, I remember I had a box, you know, a very ornate box, and inside that box, I called it my kit, and inside that box, I had all the stuff that I needed. You know, razor blades, paper, tobacco, uh, hash, uh, grass, pills, you know, whatever. And then you begin to experiment. I mean, there's a thing where it's a water pipe. You put the, you know, you put the drugs in, it's a water pipe, and the water cools the smoke so that it doesn't burn your throat when you're, when you're taking it. Well, we were smart. Uh, why put water in there? Why not put cognac in there? <laughs> I mean, if you're going to go, <laughs> you might as well go. And then of course, huh? It's starting to explain a lot. <laughs> yeah. And then your health, as well as your emotional and your spiritual stability begin to deteriorate. Well, how can it not? And so the chart for phase three looks like this. You're normal, you go to euphoria, and the euphoria turns the corner and it doesn't bring you back to normal again, it brings you to pain. And then you know you're in trouble. Before you, you were normal, you got high, you came back to normal. But now, your normal sort of, you get high and then you crash and you end up in pain. And there's only one, other, one way to get rid of that pain. And what do you think that way is? Well, to take more chemicals. So there's pain without chemicals. So the journey begins at pain and goes to euphoria and just goes straight back to pain. There's pain and high with a stop at normal. This is the point when you're losing your job, you're losing your family, you're losing your friends because of your dependency. People don't want to be around you anymore. And then remember, we, we're, not even, we're not at addiction yet. We're at dependency, addiction, People who are dependent need chemicals to function normally. Addicts need chemicals to stay alive, to be sane. Some of the markers for full-blown addiction are using chemicals simply to feel normal. Addicts cannot get to euphoria anymore they use to stop the self-induced pain caused by chemical abuse. This is different than the true and natural pain caused, for example, by a broken ankle. There's that kind of pain. I'm talking about the kind of pain from withdrawal. The addict's pain is caused by the abuse of chemicals. An addict feels pain because there's no infusion of chemicals in his system or her system. These withdrawals include nausea and sweats, blackouts, paranoia, fear, loathing of self. Users seek to escape the pain by changing location. You ever wonder why Addicts move, They're, you're never in one place. They think that if they move somewhere else and start somewhere else, the pain will stop, but it, it doesn't. Loss of desire to live and complete spiritual bankruptcy. And then of course, from a spiritual perspective, fatalism, the thought that there's no way out so, and here's, here's the ironic part, the, the, the thought that there's no way out, so I might as well continue using. <laughs> it 
What, <laughs> I know that doesn't make any sense to us. Hopefully everybody here is sober, but to the addict that makes, that makes sense. Now remember, uh, here, let me show you the graph. This is the graph for addiction. Notice it's all pain. There's no normal, there's no euphoria. It's just pain. Greater or lesser degrees of pain, but it's all pain. And so according to research on the subject, addiction is the final step in a process where one learns to use various substances in order to affect the brain in altering one's perception of reality or what is quote, normal. So activities and personality adaptations. Two of the things that happen to people who are addicted are that their personalities change as well as their activities. For example, things like Paranoia, unnatural fear and suspicious, suspicion rather. Depression, feelings of loss and self-hatred. Uh, uh, narcissism, relationship with the chemical becomes more important than all other relationships. That's why addicts will steal from their parents, steal from you know, their, grand, their poor sick grandmother who's on welfare, they'll steal from her. To go, buy, to go buy drugs. Intimacy, uh, for addicts, there's this inability to form or maintain an intimate relationship. Uh, manipulation, addicts manipulate social situations to their advantage. Uh, this is a highly prized skill among abusers. Who's going to manipulate who? Risk taking. In other words, taking chemicals to induce euphoria, this is risky. Maintaining the habit provides excitement. Going without chemicals actually seems boring. I, I remember, again, back in the day, I remember someone who would say, hey, let's all go over to Johnny's house. He's having a barbecue and blah, blah, blah. And the first question was, uh, are they do any drugs? Johnny, you know, get some stuff? No, 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 it's just, you know, maybe there'll be some beer or something. Yeah, no, thanks. You guys go, have a good time. Because if there's no drugs, there's no, no reason to go. Authority, addicts reject every type of authority. Authority opposes their continued use of chemicals. I mean, the term is addict, addicted. And then morality. The need for drugs is stronger than the need to love or to do what is right. So women, more than men, but men too, but women will sell themselves for drugs. They'll do anything simply to, to have drugs. Why do you think that uh, those who use women to make money, they call them pimps, why do you think one of the very first things that they do when they seduce a young woman into this kind of life is to get her addicted to drugs. They get her addicted to drugs, she'll do anything to get drugs. All he has to do is just keep supplying her the drugs and she will do whatever he tells her to do in order to get drugs. I mean, it's horrid, of course. Now, as discouraging as these traits may be, those who work with addicts and study their behavior say that many of these personality characteristics and activities are caused by a person's use of drugs. The good news is that these traits can be reversed with the withdrawal from chemical abuse. Now I know, you know, it's a Wednesday night, I'm busy, I've worked hard, I've avoided the COVID demon. I come to church on Wednesday night and I hear an uplifting lesson about addiction. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. This is just, uh, you know, lesson one. This is the bad news. This is, you know, uh, if you're wondering, you know, I tell you stories about myself. I was at the dependency level 
and I woke up. I, I finally woke up and said, okay, if you continue to do this, you're going to die. And I didn't want to die. And I started searching for God. That was, all, that was the only other thing. Remember, I've told you before, you know, I said, God, if you're out there, let me find you. Let me find you if you're out there. All right, so this has been a, a brief introduction to the subject of addiction. What causes it, how it progresses, and the effects, the various effects that it has on us. Uh, it's not an exhaustive study, of course, but I'm just trying to you know, uh, help you to realize uh, that it's a complex issue. It's not just, hey, stop that. It's, 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 not, that, it's not that simple. Okay. Now in our, in our next session, uh, we're going to examine why people begin to abuse chemicals and what the Bible says on the subject. And of course, we're going to talk about how to avoid and how to recover from dependency or addiction or whatever from uh, various chemicals and things to which we may have become addiction. All right, well, that's our lesson, our introductory lesson uh, to this uh, subject. A couple of more on these and hopefully we'll, we'll start having the more good news part of this as we go on. Uh, and that's our lesson for tonight. Thank you very much.